I'll just quickly introduce the topic. So we, we're going to talk about um, coming out um, today and how sort of it has affected each of our lives. Um, I want to keep a, as, as wide of a net as possible with regards to coming out. And I think, you know, I'll try to make sure that that's the case with the sort of prompts that I'm going to give you guys as well. But, uh, you know, feel free to interpret it as broadly as, as it feels uh, good and comfortable for you guys. Um, for all of the part, uh, participants, or rather the audience, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function and then towards the end, uh, we'll get to those if we have time. Um, and then with that, I'll uh, get going. So I guess, um, Sam, since, uh, since you decided to ask uh, about, uh, you know, how my day was, I'm like going to... <laughs> I'm going to pick on you because why sure. not? <laughs> Teach me to be social. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the first question is specifically, yeah. I want to focus on your time at MIT because I think it's, you know, specifically relevant to any students uh, that are still there. Uh, and I, you know, the first question is, you know, were you out during your time at MIT? And if so, uh, how do you think that impacted your experience? Oh, um, okay. So... The short answer is yes, I was, and it impacted my experience for the better. The long answer um, uh, is I was coming from Kansas. Um, I had just attended my undergrad at Kansas State University, where we didn't even have an LGBT resource center in the state until I founded one um, at my university. So let's just be very clear, wasn't the most Westboro Baptist Church protested me personally multiple times. So like, it was not a great space for um, development of my, of, my, of my identity. But I got to MIT and I, I tell this story kind of flippantly, but now that I look back on it, kind of really proud of MIT. I was on a Office of Graduate Education um, Diversity Fellowship. So I actually had all of my MIT days paid for because I was LGBT. So my like coming out paid for my for my um, experience in a way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I had no problem. I had no problem at all seeing the benefit because although obviously I was qualified uh, to get into MIT um, based on my own experiences, it was clear to me that univer the university understood that having people with my perspective and my identity would make everyone else's education experience a little bit better too. That's why they were putting this, this money where their mouth is kind of moment. Um, and so, yeah, I, it was, I, I like to tell a lot of people that I basically in, in uh, there in Boston, like came out in a shower of glitter because I was no longer under the pressure cooker of Kansas. And so I was trying everything in terms of like expression. My clothes were like changing wildly each week um, based on what I was trying on and seeing kind of what fit for me in a safe way to do it. Also it's MIT, so no one cared about my fashion at all anyway. Uh, so like it was pretty, it was a great place for me to like explore identity. So was I, did I already come out? Yes, but did I like come out and learn more about myself while at MIT? Absolutely, yes, as well. Okay, awesome. And what about the flip side of that? Like, um, you know, do you think there's there are any ways that the Institute can better support, uh, you know, queer students, alums, faculty, staff, uh, from based on your experiences? Obviously, you know, I think all of us have been out a few years, so things may have changed a little bit, but just based on that perspective. True. Uh, yeah, it's changed probably a little bit, but I think um, we we do a disservice as a university if we don't recognize that the um, outness of each individual as they're coming to this university is going to be different, right? Like I came out in a shower of glitter because I was finally safe and now I didn't have all of the pressure. But that can kind of be a lot for a person to take for, a nut, for many of my other peers at MIT during my time. I was way too much, like way, way too much um, in terms of outness. They were still figuring out like basic steps of their identity um, in social in social situ situations. So I think that creating creating events, creating spaces that allow both what I would call the supra flamboyant 
and the just starting to figure out yourself to actually coexist is a really important part of education that you don't need to orient your all of your services toward one extreme or the other you actually want to be serving as many as possible there's going to be specific challenges for each of us for a person who's super flamboyant for example like myself tons of you know bullying and really abusive behavior by people not necessarily only at MIT but in the community as well because i was i was a poster child for um this kind of experience and then for i was seeing that like some of my other peers who were out but weren't really like i wouldn't call it wouldn't weren't the flamboyant weren't the like telling everyone their experiences were being erased there there wasn't services for them because there was kind of there was this idea of like well they 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 don't exist right there's no thing there so i would say if there was one like lesson learned from mit that we could really take away from it it's orient your services toward not not only just the middle right but also both extremes of outness um so that way your services actually serve all yeah i think that makes a lot of sense and it actually kind of echoes my personal experience as well where like at the time like i was in i was definitely in the more figuring stuff out uh camp and so you know looking at like the rainbow lounge and stuff like that that felt very overwhelming and i was like oh, i don't i don't know if that's for me now looking back on i'd be like yeah let's host drag drag race watch nights uh you know that would be my vibe today but obviously like you have to cater to both so that in in, in whatever way makes sense so that you can actually you know, uh, get people up. to the plane. I'm going to ask the same question to Myra, uh, you know. Hmm? Yep, you broke up a little bit there for me. So, but I got I got the gist of it, Hal. Okay. <laughs> and, and thanks, Sam. And uh, well, my experience was, and, and it's, uh, I'll contextualize it. I arrived at MIT in the fall of 1994, which is eons ago. Um, I had been out for about five years prior to coming to MIT. I'd been living in Boston um, and I was a more mature student. I'd been working for five, six years before I went to grad school at MIT. And when I arrived on campus, I was out. Um, I actually, in retrospect, I didn't explore any resources available to me at MIT because I was established in a community in Boston. Yeah. I had my life outside of MIT. I came to MIT. I was focused. I was getting my, my PhD. I was doing my chemistry. And that, you know, that, that was how I, I approached it. Now, as I look back and to build on what you and Sam said is, I think, um, and I know MIT is working on their five-year DE&I plan and they've put in the assistant deans for diversity and inclusion in the schools. I think we can start as a university at the very beginning on how we present to potential students, how we, um, how we actually go recruit for admissions, how we in the admissions process are, are, are potential students seeing a diversity of people that are the face of MIT. You know, um, there's sm small but meaningful things around in application processes. Can you put your, your, your pronouns down? Can you put a name other than that's on your, your, your official documentation? All of that is signaling to students what kind of university they're coming into. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that can be done, certainly, as you said, on campus. Um, being able to support the full spectrum of people who are just wondering and not sure and they're thinking about it to those of us who were, were quite out and, and, and very present. Um, so I, I had a great experience. My group that I was in was very accepting. Um, you know, I brought my partner to events at the time. I ended up meeting my spouse in the same group at MIT. So I, I, I told my thesis advisor, I said, I said Dick, you know, it's great I got a PhD from MIT, but I've a spouse of 25 plus years now as well. So uh, I had a great experience. I know it's not everyone's experience. I think it's maybe a function of where I was in my life. For me, coming out was a very, um, gave me a lot of energy and positive. It was very liberating. I wanted to shout it from the mountaintops for a while, at least at one period in my life, that's where I was, where you thought you could conquer the world. So very, very positive experience at MIT, but I, having worked in corporate and having tried to move the needle in inclusion, there's some key things that, that you can do along the whole segment of people coming into MIT, being at MIT, and then post as alum. Right. And I think that's a, you know, that's a pretty good segue to, a, to the next question, I think that I, uh, you know, have, which is, you know, usually we think of coming out 
very much in the context and talk about coming out very much in the context of friends and family. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's kind of it, right? There's coming out within your career, coming out in academia with the people you work with, that, that can also impact your life and impact your experience with that um, in, in a multitude of different ways. Uh, you know, there's obviously, depending on uh, how inclusive the workplace is, for instance, you could face more barriers just because you came out or just, you know, just because you present a certain way. Uh, how can you talk, can, and I'm, I'm not going to specifically call names at this point, so mm -hmm. I'm just going to open it up. Can you guys uh, think about like experiences like that where, you know, specifically in the realm of careers and academia uh, coming out has affected you? And, you know, I'll start with one thing, uh, how as well, just to add to that, which is uh, another important part of coming out for me, and I think for many people, is coming out to yourself. You know, that that was, I really had to to reflect on that. And, and that that actually happened years before I came out to anyone else. You know, I managed to repress it, being the good Irish Catholic, in very Catholic, repressive Ireland in the 70s and 80s. Bury that for a while. But to answer your question, um, uh, you know, for me, uh, Leaving MIT, I went from 10 years in the liberal East Coast and I took a job in Geneva, Switzerland, okay, um, which was a, in a family owned private company. Okay, so it, it was a very, it was much more uh, conservative, I would say, society I went into. Um, and I went there initially alone. Uh, my partner stayed in the US. So there was a period where I basically, I would say, stepped back into the closet you know, um, and uh, it took me, I think I, I, I set about building relationships in the workplace and getting a sense of the culture in that workplace um, before I did come out. I, ultimately, I did come out, my partner moved to Switzerland, we ended up uh, being out in Switzerland. But for me, the, the, the strategy, and it, it, it it, in, it, that was in the first company that I worked in. And for me, I had to um, I felt build relationships and make it personal for people so that they knew Myra, the Myra that showed up, um, and they knew competent Myra, look, this is what I can do, um, and then start to, to reveal other parts of my life over time. Um, you know, I know some people now, again, I'm talking 25 years ago, 20 plus years ago, uh, it, it's, it's a more, it can be a more uh, rapid for some people, but for me, I had to build a coalition I'll almost say you know and then come out gradually to um, a, a core group of people and then after that it was easier and almost like I, I didn't uh, it wasn't it was less of a burden what I will say about the core I'm sorry Hal what I will say about the corporate yeah, environment is and I, I speak from experience in this where where um, I, I, I headed up diversity and inclusion for an S&P 500 in quite a conservative industry in that it can you can have a very inclusive company in inside, but you can be dealing with very different audiences when it comes to customers in particular, which can make it very difficult. You know, I have a very close friend who's trans non-binary, and they said that's their big fear is going out into the field with customers and having to do it a day in day out in a, in a conservative industry. So it also I think the industry you, you, you um, play in can also impact your experience. That makes a lot of sense. And one thing, one of the things that you said struck, uh, struck out at me, especially, you mentioned that um, you wanted people to see the competent Myra. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is an extra barrier, not, a, not necessarily a barrier, but extra, like, I have to prove that I'm competent so that like people can't uh, think of me in certain ways uh, that is like an extra I don't know if you want to call it like a handicap almost mm -hmm. like applied to queer folks that's like we have to do better than our peers just because we have to prove ourselves more so than they need to has that been your experience look I think and, and it's, it's an internal experience I think because I would never presume to know what other people think mm -hmm. but I definitely say there's some part of me internally going I better be good at my job in order to be able to survive and thrive as a queer woman, okay? And you know, it's funny you raise that because I was just reading a, 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 psych, a psychology book this week um, and this, this author said, you know, we're born with three fundamental drives. The drive for closeness with other people, 
um, the drive for autonomy in our lives, being able to like set the agenda for our lives and, and be agents, active agents in our lives and the drive for competence and being able to master. And I was reflecting on this when thinking about this coming out uh, discussion tonight going, you know, competence is something you, you can do um, without being out almost. You can be competent to a certain level without being out. It's very hard to have close relationships with people or to have be an agent, an active agent in your life and really shape your life if you're mm. not out, uh, to, to, especially to those that you care about. So to answer your question, that was a long way around to say, I personally feel, mm -hmm. and that may be self-imposed, that I have to hit, hit a high bar. And that makes a lot of sense. Sam, do you have any thoughts? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I, I mean, <laughs> this is a good question because I think it's it's anecdotally, right? Because I think we don't, we don't, we don't, again, I'm with Myra, like, welcome to its internal um, review. We, we, we don't have a way of testing, like, all the gays versus the straights as, like, how confident right. they are. But there has been a psycho psychological um, connection for many, and this is for gay men, I don't identify as either of those things, but like uh, the, uh, for, for many gay men of golden boy syndrome, the idea of being so good um, at everything because your parents were rejecting you for this one thing. So if everything else was great, maybe they wouldn't reject you. And this was seen over and over again. I know that at least for, for me, I have talked about... Um, my academic privilege as combating my loss of privilege um, by being by being trans, right? Like there's not very many nuclear engineers in the world. Literally, there's just like very few of us. And so if you get rid of one of us, it's actually moderately hard to find another person who can do that work, which I consider like a privilege. It is legitimately a rarity. I get to have more power by being something that is not common and and takes a lot of study uh to to do and that combats mm -hmm. so that we i've had been in many a, a room with nuclear engineers who i'm the first trans person they've ever met without a doubt and yet they're like yeah but they're sam so we know that everyone's trusting them what is going on here it's this very confusing system mm -hmm. where my degree got me in the room and now that i'm in the room it's kind of uh well we we can't now we'd feel awful if we if we reject them because right. this is a system um that we've already given them the the thumbs up so so yeah i think there's definitely a competency drive mm -hmm. i think there's also um and this is one of my theories that is debatable so uh take it as you wish which is i believe lgbtq people are by their very nature more competent than non-LGBTQ people. And here's here's my here's my reason why. Um, so to the straight allies on the call, I'm sorry, but you're not as cool. Um, which <laughs> is LGBTQ people by their very nature are combating and fighting a presupposition. The world has told them that the world act acts is they are this way. And then they by self-discovery, as Myra just said, right, like with a lot of work, overcome that pressure and see the world differently. They understand the world differently. I think that difference is actually a, a competency that others literally cannot have. That's kind of a, it's kind of, we get a step up. Yes, we have to work really hard, but we get a step up before everyone else does because we're able to view the world in ways that aren't common, aren't, aren't normalized, aren't even generally accepted um, uh, in some spaces. And that level of seeing a problem from a different angle, I think we all know at MIT, is worth its weight in gold. Like you could just never, never value it enough because you're so innovative that you've literally broken the social barriers of love and identity like these are things that are that that people would get phds in um to try to study how a person develops this way and you got it naturally so to the lgbtq people i say that our coming out is kind of like our we already get our degree in identity like we 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 already got to be cooler than the cool kids um in that way uh that's my there's my hot take. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> love, love the hot take. I feel like a super a superpower. You should. Right? You should. You are a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I, 
I think one thing that's interesting is how identity, you mentioned identity, and I think identity spans multiple things and people identify with multiple different facets of life. Obviously as queer people, like that's a major aspect of our identity, but frequently queer people coming um, from certain backgrounds also have to grapple with specific religious identities. And I wanted to ask you guys about that. Um, and one of the one of the audience members actually also asked this question, and it was also a part part of one of my questions. So it's just you know uh, very serendipitous. Uh, <laughs> but that would be my next question: is you know how how have you if if you have dealt with the influence of religion on your life, both external uh, in terms of just like kind of people around you, but also internal of like your personally held religious beliefs? How has have those impacted uh, your experience of coming out uh, and continue to, to this day? Um, Sam, I'll kick it off because I know we both, we both have, have like- We do, We're, this is gonna be a good question. They're very, they're very, they're different in, uh, to some degree in your sure, sure. um, Look, how for context, I was raised in Ireland in the 70s and 80s. You know, I'm one of the older end of Gen X's. So I was raised in a country where the Catholic Church held sway over every aspect of society. I mean, every aspect of society. Yep. Um, and I, you know, school was, was uh, all girls school, taught by nuns, the brothers, my brothers taught by the brothers. And the fear of God was put into you about any, I mean, name an aspect of just what would now be considered normal life. It was, everything was couched in a very repressive um, ideology and it was a very repressed society as a result, which gave rise to a whole host of other issues that we could spend days talking about. Um, but what that did to me was, um, I think it really, uh, it was tough, I would say, coming coming to grips first with myself, like I said, com, com, because I had been raised in a very strict Catholic environment where, where, where the church was the, the law in essence, and having to overcome that internally, because, you know, again, growing up where you hear from the pulpit day in, day out, if, you don't, if you're not X, Y, and Z, you're, you're not good enough, you're not acceptable. Um, and my parents, you know, were born around 1930. So these were people who had no experience in, in what I was experiencing. Um, so it definitely, it challenged me, my, my, my Catholicism, the internalized homophobia that you have to overcome and that, that rears its head at times when you least expect it because it's been so, be, you know, beaten metaphorically into you, sometimes physically into you. Um, and then I, I would say, so really it, it, it impacted me as well. I would say, because my parents had to do work to overcome that. I was lucky because they, they reached out and they said, you know, particularly my mother, I don't know anything about this. Help me understand it. So that was back in the night, back in the early nineties, off down to Provincetown, I went and into the bookstore and here's a book for parents. Now that you know, mail it off to Ireland. And she'd, get it. she'd read it and say, your dad's reading it now. So, but she, you know, that she still would go to mass and hear things that didn't jive with her, the reality of not one, but it ended up three of her children, three out of seven. Okay. So, um, so I think religion really, really impacted me in terms of my sense of self and who I was for a long time and, and, and getting through to me and accepting me. And then it, it, it took a lot of work, particularly on my, my, my parents' side as being older, to, to, to work through that. Uh, they did, and they were open to it. But undoubtedly, my religious indoctrination, I still live with that today, I would say. It's not something you can wipe the slate clean and, and, and you know, you know they're recovering Catholic, I'm sure you're recovering blank, whatever you want to put there. Um, so, so without a doubt, religion was hugely impactful on, on me as a person and, and how I came about and came out. What is the process? What would you say is the process for dealing with it? Like, is it, you know, really questioning and understanding your beliefs? And then, you know, when a certain belief that has been sort of more or less indoctrinated comes up, you challenge that head on with like, is this truly something I believe? Like, is, 
you know, or put, put a different way, you know, does this belief make me a better person? Is that, is that kind of, I don't want to put words into your mouth, obviously, no, 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 but no. like, is that kind of the process? What is the process of dealing, think, sorting that out? For, how for me, first of all, I had to put space between me and the culture. So that's actually, it, it coincided with me moving to the U.S. I didn't realize mm -hmm. I to stay in the U.S. So that allowed me to step out of the context and then almost look back at it, if that makes sense. Sure. And then, mm -hmm. and then I, I spent time in Boston where um, I was, my eyes were open to a, a fantastic world of diversity of every sort. I used to ride the 39 bus down Huntington Avenue because I lived in, I worked in Children's Hospital. And to me, it was like the magic bus. There was people from all over the world. There's different colors, creeds, languages. And this whole world opened up for me, which helped me realize that the world was a much bigger place and that there was a place, there was space for all kinds of people in the world, including me and who I was. So really, I think the fact that I stepped out of the culture and gave them and, and saw the world as a bigger place, how? And then I wasn't as maybe structured in my thinking going, mm, how do I feel about that belief? I was more, I'd say it was part of my personality. I, I would just quite happily, um, I, maybe I'm quite argumentative, my father might have said, but I would, I would just say, I don't accept that, you know, and, and, and move on with it. Um, so, but I, I, for me, it was stepping out of that environment and being able to see a bigger world, recognize how, how multicultural and diverse the world was and that there was space for me, and then be able to go back into that context and deal with it. That makes a lot of sense. I think that I, I, I very much identify with that too, because you know, even though I didn't come from a particularly religious background, as far as my family is concerned, I did come from a religious country, which is, you know, I'm from Turkey originally, and I grew up there, and I basically moved to the U.S. for MIT when I was 19, mm -hmm. and came out, you know, a couple of years later, and it, in that sense, I very much identify with this idea of just, like, if you step out of it, you realize that there's so much more, and that there's space for you to fit in, not even fit in, but make space for yourself. Like there's just, there's room there and everybody can co kind of coexist without you necessarily, you know, in infringing on anybody else's anything. Um, so yeah. What about, what about you, Sam? Any, any insights, any thoughts there? Yeah. I, I mean, my, my path is, as, as Myra said, is, is quite similar at the beginning and different at the end, um, uh, which is, I, I was this child of Southern Baptist missionaries, right? Like I have traveled the world spreading faith. Uh, well, not I didn't, my parents did. I just was along for the ride of cookies, right? But like, like that, that, that world was so ingrained, so much so, um, and I won't go into in detail because I'm not having that kind of a night, but like that literally my parents indoctrinated so much with faith um, that they practiced conversion therapy on me trying to erase my sexuality after it was found out with the power of faith mm -hmm. that would for 99.999 percent of people um be enough to say i will never even consider this world again um and in, i did leave faith for a while but then return to it for a weird reason which was the stability and consistency um i could see benefits to a community that practiced um, good good things. Now, I didn't have to practice them because of fear. Um, I'm, I, as, as, as Myra pointed out so well, maybe I didn't need a big bad person above me to be like threatening me with death um, uh, to do good, but at least I could see benefit to people who wanted um, to do this good and had been, been raised with a similar ideology that at least I could feel safe and comforted in. Uh, I I now practice my faith openly. Um, my it was a little bit awkward for me, I'll be honest, at MIT because those of us who are people of faith are kind of treated more as ostracized <laughs> than gays. Um, I'm not joking. It legitimately is like those of us who are like, well, I'm going to church. They're like, you're doing what? <laughs> like if I would have said I was going to the gay club, that would have been like a normal Tuesday, but they were like terrified that I was going to church. Um, I now openly like preach in a church every once in a while. Um, it is a, it's a part of my life. I think the major part of my recovery about this though, was that it was my decision 
to walk back in on my own accord with the knowledge that I gained from a life of experience. This is the problem of indoctrination is that you don't have consent. You don't have the option. You are literally being told this is the experience you will have, which for people who have fought to understand their own identity is by its very nature, literally like nailing the closet door closed. That's what you're basically doing um, with this indoctrination is that everything you understand cannot actually come out. Um, and that's that's rough. So I now try to openly, I have, I've said to many, like I'm still a missionary. I just am a missionary in my own way, right? If you see my life and you're like, hmm, Sam is openly a person of faith and they, you know, uh, also happen to be, you know, a person that I think I like the way that they're living their life. Maybe that means that faith isn't all bad. And if that's the way that I can be a missionary, I think that's a much better way than showing up and telling people that they're going to hell if they don't believe me, right? Like that tends to be a little bit easier um, of a pill to swallow. Doesn't <laughs> MIT never swallowed it, but um, uh, I would say that it has given me a lot of um, a lot of really, really good, good. Um, calm and consistent uh, ways of managing life's pressures. So if you ever want how, you can play your, um, all of the like RuPaul discology um, and I will play, you know, my good old hymns uh, from uh, from church and we'll, we'll, you know, just jam out together. So we got- Sounds this. good. We can just remix them, mash them up together and make a- Remixed RuPaul and Bible hymns seems like exactly what we should do this well. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it could it could work. You wouldn't expect it to, but that's when the best things happen. Sometimes. Exactly. Myra yeah. will figure out a nice Catholic mass uh, <laughs> um, uh, to, to mix in there too. We got this. We got this. <laughs> Cute guys. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, uh, sticking with the theme of identity and uh, as part of sort of talking about religion, uh, both of you kind of mentioned this. Uh, one thing that I want to sort of dig into a little bit deeper is uh, internalized homophobia. Um, you know, I think when we, when we think about the word homophobia, we think like grand external gestures that are like, you know, somebody screaming out a slur across the street, or, you know, you, someone actively being stripped of their rights or, you know, not being able to qualify for housing, for instance, because of, because of their gender identity or just, you know, awful things like that imposed externally upon queer people. But and obviously those things are horrible. <laughs> um, but there's also a piece that is internalized, which is that, you know, <clears throat> what we what we have throughout our often throughout our upbringing come to tell ourselves about who we are and that it's bad um, because, uh, you know, either because we have uh, sort of convinced ourselves that we're never going to get married or convince ourselves that we're never going to have children or uh, that life as we, you know, as, as a perhaps an infant be be imagined to be is no longer the case. And so, you you know, that could be one of the reasons why uh, you tend to inter internalize it. And then that kind of affects your peace with yourself. Um, sort of getting to the getting to the point of the question, um, you know, how, what have you have you guys experienced uh, internalized homophobia? And you know how have you handled um, ha handled it? How have you dealt with it? And you know that that is total the the one part of the answer just from my personal experience is that there's no like handling it. It's like permanently over. We're good. Uh, you know. So maybe perhaps reframing the question slightly as how do you handle it on a day to day ba basis? Sam, do you want to kick it off? I, uh, yeah, mine's not as happy. So Myra, hopefully yours will be a little bit more happy. Um, I'm usually the optimist, but mine's not gonna be, I'm gonna be honest, Hal. We're gonna have like a really honest moment here, but it's not gonna be super happy. Um, I have a lot of internalized homophobia in large part because they used really abusive practices on my mental health and my physical health to train me that I wasn't what I was. With conversion therapy, I was severely damaged. I, I am beautiful the way I know. I, I'm going to say all my mantras that my therapist tells me, right? Like I'm beautiful the way I am. I, I'm glad I made it through. But to be clear, my internalized homophobia causes suicidal ideation in me way more than it should. I have constant moments where 
I am believing that I shouldn't exist, which is such a brain problem because then if your brain says you shouldn't exist, and I'm again, to those of you who are hearing this, you should exist, you are here, you are fine, but my brain tells me I shouldn't be here. Um, that's the level of internalized homophobia um, that I kind of wrestle with. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky to have a partner who understands that, hey, Sam is potentially going to think about suicide. I need to have systems in place that remind them that that internalized homophobia is not true, that, that, they're, that they have a place in this world and here, here's what it is. That's not great to be very clear. Like, let's be super honest. I love my husband, super love them, but I should not be putting that level of pressure on yeah. an external force. But honestly, that's one of the only things that gets me through it. And that's really, really bad because a lot of people, and I used to, to most, you know this, right? Like I used to work, um, I'm, it, I, I'm not saying that it's always um, gonna be this way, but like I used to work for a suicide prevention organization and that is our major challenge, right? Like we are, we are constantly hearing from LGBTQ youth like that they don't feel like they should exist. That's the level internally that they're hearing, that, sorry, they are hearing it so much externally that they have internalized that to the point where they don't know if they want to keep going. Mm -hmm. I, how do I manage it? I have a partner that's not a great that's not a great solution um uh but I have a partner that's one piece second is I am constantly in in um situations where I put myself into mental health care right like I I my therapist just moved but I will find a new one right like generally I'm doing really well at making sure that I get access to mental health care which we deserve the same as any physical health care I also am very cognizant that I build myself, I am, all of internalized homophobia is, it's hard to imagine for people, um, it's hard to imagine for people who are so flamboyant and so out, right? Like you, most people don't see people like me and say like, oh, they have internalized homophobia because they're like, you're clearly so externally homosexual, right? Like that, that there's no way you're internally not the same. But that's right. not true. So, so I would right. say, just like you care for your introverts and care for your extroverts, care for your flamboyance, because people, I, I, I seek out people who will support me and say, those heels look really great on you today, as a way of reminding myself that even though I'm telling myself that I shouldn't be doing this, that, that, that like there's something wrong with me, other people giving me that like compliment of, of you're okay as you are, is a really big deal. Um, to fighting the internalized homophobia because you're fighting the narrative um, that, let's be very clear, is so much stronger inside your head. That was a long answer. Hopefully, it was a great answer, though. No, it was a great, answer, yeah. no. uh, was a great answer, Sam. Yeah, I, I especially, you know, what you say, like, uh, you know, your partner is is one of the things that you know helps, but and you know, you're part of, you're kind of also couching it as like, oh, but it shouldn't be the case. But at the same time, I'm thinking like, you know. Uh, it, it kind of brings me back to a suicide prevention and intervention course that I took while I was at MIT. And the, the image that I remember seeing from that is that of a brick wall. Uh, and the brick wall is the thing that's between you and potentially uh, potential suicide. And it's all the things that are keeping you from getting to that point. And it's all about like arranging the bricks such that it's a strong wall that could handle the weight. Um, and I think of that as a piece of the wall as a piece of the brick wall you know a lot of people like for me uh it's it's similarly it's like being close with uh you know my boyfriend uh that helps a lot but there's other things like you know i love video games and it distracts me and then the the weird thoughts go away for a while and then i'm good so you know learning to understand what the pieces of bricks are for you that work for you and to uh, you know build your wall and then as you later put it like through active mental health uh, care, you know, tending to that wall as if it were a beautiful garden. I'm just throwing all analogies all together, metaphors oh, yeah. all together at this point. But you know, that's what I think keeps us here, and that's what make makes life work at the end. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, Myra, what were you gonna say? <laughs> this is no, terrible I mean, segue. With Myra. It's really, it's really, it's really interesting. You know, I had mentioned internalized homophobia or internal homophobia earlier because again coming from my background I certainly had it um I think um I rarely 
um, consciously have moments now at this hour of my life. I'm a little bit further ahead in life, maybe, um, than you guys. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and that's fine. Uh, but, you know, I, I definitely had it in my earlier years. And I think what helped me definitely was a very strong role model and my mother saying, you can stand up in the world and be yourself and, and, and go for it, girl. Um, but also, I think what really helped me, and, you know, I'm still, I think, even unpacking my lived experience. Sometimes I wondered about moments in my life, was it internalized homophobia? Or was I trying to stay safe in a world that could be unsafe for me? You know what I mean? That, you know, you being very conscious, being female, being a queer female, going, how out can you be in certain situations? You know, you're in a taxi, you're walking down the street. Is it, is it my home, internalized homophobia or is it I'm trying to stay safe in the world? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would say that what really helped me was when I started working in the DNI area about a decade ago in corporate and really becoming much more exposed to different, um, different um, identities, okay? Whether that was um, getting more exposed to people living with disabilities, whether it was the neurodiverse, whether it was uh, race and ethnicity, working with global, con co you know, cultures, um, religions, all of that helped me because the learning and how to help employees and how to help people think through this and how to be more inclusive ultimately ended up helping me becoming more inclusive to myself, if that makes sense, you know? So really being exposed to some of the more, you know, the, the more um, accomplished people in these fields and, the, and the, the, the way that they approached aspects of inclusion and the way they approached people's lived experiences and how they, they managed through it, that really helped me throw off, I would say, the, uh, the vast majority have of my internalized homophobia. Now, I'd say I'm still struggling internally with imposter syndrome. I have lived with that all my life. I was sure at MIT they were going to come to me one day and go, we actually made a mistake. Now you can leave tomorrow. <laughs> Do you know? I'm sure. because I said, Everybody is. I don't think like... a person goes to MIT without that feeling. <laughs> Do yeah. they? Because I didn't know that. You know, I was walking around with that in my head. So that still raises its head. That's still there for me where I'm going, mm, they'll definitely figure it out this time, you know? Uh, and that's followed me a, a lot more than the internalized homophobia, at least on a conscious level. Sure, that makes sense. And I, I definitely identify with that even today. Like, you know, I'm, I work as a software engineer and sometimes I see, you know, my uh, colleagues writing beautiful code and I'm like, could I have written that? do I deserve to be here? Am I stupid? And then five minutes, like a few minutes of pondering later, I'll catch myself and be like, no, I am good at my job, damn it. I deserve to be here. So I think <laughs> those affirmations are valuable. <laughs> they sure are. Um, awesome. Well, I'm going to slightly uh, move this to a little bit of a slightly lighter note, and then we'll go to some of the questions that the audience has asked us. Um, I'm going to take a take a page from uh, Drag Race when towards the end of the season, RuPaul takes up a little photo of you and is like, what would you like to tell your younger self? Uh, and basically ask that to you guys. Uh, you know, what are some things that you wish you're, you could tell yourself about coming out, uh, whether it's encouragement, information, facts, um, you know, open, open floor. Oh, I would tell my younger self to stop worrying so much and circling the drain in your head, you know, and, and, and actually recognize the people around you, but definitely stop worrying. Um, I would tell myself that your two best friends think of a development where I'm living in number 25 and number 37 is a best friend, number 57. All queer girls who didn't come out to each other till we're in our 20s. I would tell my younger self, this, there are, we're everywhere <laughs> this is up and down the road there are dozens that, of us <laughs> that would have been great as a as, as a teenager to kind of go oh wow just even one person to talk to about it would yeah. have been that's what i go back and tell my younger self going here go talk to these people well thank you um th th so th that's definitely yeah so not to worry and oh by the way there's community here you know i know it's it gets better but it actually did for me a lot better Great segue, perfectly there, which was, um, I would tell myself that you're not alone, 
but that it doesn't get better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This is the big problem, I think, that for me, my brain as a young person, when I was coming out, thought it was going to be like Glee, right? Like I thought the world was literally just going to start because I've been raised in a culture that was so oppressive that any sign of hope meant, oh, that's what the world must be like outside of my bubble. Therefore, that's what my experience is going to be like. So absolutely, I, in coming out, I would tell them that you're not alone. I'm very much like Myra, like, oh my goodness, here's all the people that you're surrounded by, but you don't know because they're all scared too. So like, go find each other. But I would also tell myself, your coming out is yours and no one deserves it. If I could have not come out to my parents and given myself safety for those few more years, think of how much less like trauma I would have had. I mean, I, I am not a believer that we need all LGBT people to go through trauma to be LGBT. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a firm believer that we do not need this common experience. Um, and so, yeah, like you're going to be okay, yeah. but also it's not going to be okay tomorrow. So I need you to get through tomorrow night, not just tonight, but tomorrow night, because that's where you're actually going to have to, you're going to see some changes. Like that's patience, patience for the gays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that actually kind of reminds me of uh, one of the things when I was do uh, deal like when I had just started coming out to people in my life and was dealing with, uh, you know, just the the stress, the stress, the trauma, the the fear, the, the pure anxiety of it all. Uh, and I was seeing, uh, you know, a doctor about it. And one of the things that he said to me that really stuck with me, which kind of aligns, I think, with you know, it's not, it may not be today, is you know, don't just look at uh, don't just look at yesterday and don't just look at tomorrow. Like, don't count the days that are better or worse. Just because tomorrow is worse doesn't mean everything is going downhill. Um, you know, it's it's an ebb and flow. But as long as the sort of it, the chart, when you zoom out, looks up and to the right, you're in the right direction. And for the most part, it Nerd. tends to. Nerd. Uh, Nerd. Nerd. <laughs> You just did it gets better as a math problem. <laughs> of yes. course you did. Math comforts me, okay? Leave me okay, alone. sorry. I won't I won't judge your I won't <laughs> comfort this <stuff. laughs> Nerd. <laughs> um all right and with with my with my nerdy charting uh for feel making myself feel better out of the way. Uh a couple of questions. Um the first uh, is uh, would the so we mentioned sort of having a uh, Sam you mentioned having a sort of superpower uh, earlier would the same would the superpower uh, uh, that you attribute to LGBTQ plus individuals also apply to any uh, to people who aren't straight cis white males okay so I've got an answer here but Myra is going to be best qualified as an actual like DEI expert in this so I will give my answer but then I would love to see Myra Myra's answer here as well I believe there is something unique about the coming out experience so being a straight white cis male gives you a lot of privilege and power and the superpower that you're getting is because you're re-evaluating the world in a way that the world is telling you doesn't exist. So you're innovating beyond an identity. To be very clear, racism clearly exists. Like, like there's no, there's no person who's really, well, there are, okay, there are people who are saying this, but like there are, there is, there is less of a coming out experience for many of the other identities that are listed other than after straight there, right? So most, as a trans person, I've had to also experience the kind of the loss of privilege of the male, but then the benefit of the superpower of the trans, right? That is, a, that is an area where you can kind of come out because you get to you get to experience and understand something that the world doesn't see. Many of the other identities, however, are prescribed and, and from birth, you, and you don't actually get to come out as this experience. You don't get to have a uh, no, I'm not moment. You live your life as this disadvantaged individual in terms of privilege, and you have to create your own superpowers of confidence and community and all of the, and confidence, right? Those are all ways that you're get over it. But no, I, I, I believe that LGBTQ people have this superpower because of the coming out experience as a way, even if that coming out experience is, is spectacular, right? Even if it is a mom and dad throw you a party for coming out, <laughs> you still got to tell them this experience and have the mental um, work 
of that innovation on identity that they didn't get to have. Um, uh, and that is a non-familial transferred superpower. Okay, there we go. That's my, that's my, that's my, that's my way. That's a great, Myra, tell me Sam, how I'm wrong. Sam, it's re that's a really, really, you know, I always, I always enjoy conversations with you, Sam, and I always, <laughs> I always learn to get a different perspective. You know, I was thinking about this and, and, um, and listening to you and, and as you describe the superpower and searching my brain, one, one, one area where I think maybe I would see it, it potentially also applying is with the newer diverse. Okay. Mm, great point. Where, where, where folks may live just like that and, and that, that there's common, there's parallels, you know, they may not, they, they may pass as, you know, your average person, whatever, not having a, something of a difference or um, just like LGBTQ can pass for years and years and years and do the work. So neurodiversity might be one area that I would say could also possess the superpower. Now I have friends in the deaf community who have passed um, as not hearing impaired and it's only been in, in an audience of hundreds when they've actually given a keynote and said, growing up deaf and you hear the audience going, <gasps> You know, so so again, but definitely newer diversity be one area where I think will be worth mining. Very wise, friend. Very wise. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Uh, I will quickly move to the next questions because I want to get get through a bunch of these before we uh, finish up. Um, this is directed at Sam. Uh, I don't mean to be inappropriately nosy, but uh, and you know, feel free to uh, reject the question if it's if you feel it's too nosy. Sure. Do you mean you still identify as specifically a Southern Baptist? How do you and your church make that jibe with the SBC's vocal, political, and cultural issues with queerness and gender? Asking from beautiful Lynchburg, Virginia. Well, I used to be a Virginian. Um, uh, I am now a Marylander or a Marylandian. I don't know what we are actually. Um, so. Um, so I identify currently as an evangelical Christian. Um, uh, my Baptist side is actually American Baptist. No longer, I don't no longer preach in a Southern Baptist church. American Baptist, to those of you who don't know, is kind of the response to a Southern Baptist church. Um, it's also called Northern Baptist. Um, uh, I actually went to the one of the very first Northern Baptist churches um, right on Harvard, near Harvard's campus, which is the closest Baptist church there to MIT. All that being said, I work inside systems. So my work in general has been Trojan horse. So I, war, war, I walk into a, into a space that is not welcoming, not a great place. And then I, I slowly over time build trust and confidence and consent around my identities and my experiences and change systems from the inside. That's my way of activism. I am not usually gonna be in the streets um, uh, with, with pitchforks or not, they don't wear pitchforks. <laughs> Welcome to the Kansas farmer there. Okay, uh, uh, you know, in the streets with signs, I'm going to be the person in the boardroom who says, actually my pronouns are they and them. And, and it is that level of working inside a system that works for me and my faith. It's not for everybody. I do not recommend, it's not even for my husband. So like, I'm very, I understand the differentiation in space. So I know that was a long answer, but short answer is I identify as an evangelical Christian in Northern Baptist uh, spaces, but I wouldn't feel uncomfortable. And I have been in many Southern Baptist churches throughout my, throughout my life as a person who believes that working there saves more lives than working in a church where I will ne necessarily be almost too accepted, um, where my coming out doesn't have an impact. Wow, that's cool. I don't think I would be able to do that. <laughs> I'm much more <laughs> the grab the people and go on the street kind. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's why we. That's why we're in this together. Uh, yeah. Here we go. High school musical. We're all in this. <laughs> Sorry, it was there. It was there. It was there. Um. Let's see. Uh, there's one comment that is, uh, you all speak as, as if nerd is a bad thing when we were talking about being nerdy, when it's actually another one of Sam's superpowers. I think it's all of our superpower as MIT oh. students yeah. and alums and affiliates. Um, but it's also make fun of people for being nerdy. So I accept that. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, Hal. I didn't mean to offend. No, I don't, I don't mind it at all. I also make fun of my friends for being nerdy. So it's yeah. like, you know, if you can't dish it, if you can't take it, you can't dish it up. That's that's the, the library thing. is open. Exactly. The library Welcome. is open. 
Um, this will be the last question because we're at time. Um, ironically, I don't know if any of us is super well equipped to answer this question, but I'll try. Many of us have been away from campus for decades. What is the environment today for LGBTQ students? I, can't, I don't think any of us can answer for today because we're not students, but I can answer for 2015. And that's, that doesn't feel like, you know, it's too long ago. Um, as far as when it, what it was like in, on campus in 2015, honestly, it was just very easy um, to come out on campus. It, it was so easy that it wasn't a thing, like is, is kind of how I, how I felt it literally. And I will give you an example. Two of my friends uh, that, that I was really close, still am really close with, um, I came out, I decided I wanted to come out to them first. Um, I came out to one of them and he just sort of having sort of experienced this with other folks uh, who weren't necessarily, ex uh, weren't necessarily accepted. He, his initial reaction was big hug, I still love you, we're, we're best friends, you, you're, you're all good. And that was kind of the thing I wanted to hear in that moment, and so that was great um and the other one the my other friend i came out to him and i literally said like hey i'm gay and then he goes okay uh yeah so what, what were we thinking for brunch like it was just that much not a thing uh and in his case it was like maybe a little too like uh a little too much not a thing it was almost like hey i want some like recognition that this kind of matters but at the same time it was also reassuring in a way that it was like, hey, you know, this changes absolutely nothing. Like literally it changes so little that we can, once the sentence is over, we can continue discussing our lunch, brunch, whatever plans. Uh, and so that was my experience uh, of what MIT is currently like with LGBT students. Uh, I don't know, Sam, I, we did cross, but I don't, you were a couple of years behind me, I think, but, or maybe, I don't know when you graduated. Did you also do 2015? 2014. So oh, okay, I was there you go. So, you know. I was a year before you and grad school, which was very different. Grad school is such a different experience um, uh, when oh, it I comes bet. to yeah. out experiences, but it was it was easy. Um, I think the problem is just that we're still working, and and we we'll all end on this part, which is it's just still harder for trans than for LGB, LGB, right? Like that that's that is the hard part is that we're still working a lot on trans and non-binary parts at MIT that it was easy to be bisexual it was not easy to be non-binary that is the um and that distinction is I think is important for us to work on agreed agreed all right um we are two minutes over so anybody have any closing comments uh thank you both so much uh for uh you know being willing participants uh thank you Thank you to all the attendees uh, for coming and joining us. Thank you to Moana for putting it together and organizing the Zoom and getting the mailers out and doing all the fun bits uh, that you know us outside of campus <laughs> aren't as well equipped to do anymore. Um, and thank you, Hal, as well for. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'll just reading. give myself a pat on the back. Yeah. Um, any any last parting words of wisdom or uh, you know comments suggestions? Um, if you join Big Lada, we'll be one to the attendees, pay attention, we're here and we're going to be more and more visible throughout the coming months. We now have a board of directors and you're looking at three of them here tonight. So um, please uh, engage with us because that's how we can have impact at MIT and beyond. And again, Hal, just thanks for the opportunity. I think it's always good to, to be visible and have these kind of conversations. And we touched on a lot of things tonight that I hope were valuable to people. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Bye y'all. Bye-bye.